Can't I can't hear you, John? You know, can you unmute him? Thank you. You're now. You good? I do. Okay. First, first item on the agenda is approval of minutes of March first, twenty twenty-two, facilities committee meeting. Is there a motion to approve those? A move by Mr. Benahan. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Macaron. Is there any discussion or edits? All in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Okay. Next on the agenda is presentation presentation of stewardship report. Uh, this was transmitted a few months ago, I think, but it was it was kind of last minute at the time, so we just wanted to do it again, uh, so people had time to digest it uh, in advance of the meeting. So. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Garcia to talk about this and respond to any questions. Beautiful. Thank you for having us, uh, for having me. Usually have the team with me, but the team's shrinking. Um, <laughs> so the stewardship report is a way for us to report on and give everyone a sense of the magnitude of the district, um, the things that we're responsible for, and sort of giving you an overview of the staff numbers and some historical data so we can sort of put into perspective and really understand where we are as a department. So on the first page, we discuss what the district looks like. Um, we're close to 4 million square feet. We're 3.7 million square feet of, uh, of school district 41 properties and uh, just short of 300 acres, 299 acres. Since in 2014, the district has grown substantially, uh, 103 uh, additional square feet and 28 acres. So there has been an increase to the district in, in what in, in what, uh, eight year time frame. The what, next what one, you, you, sorry, what do you attribute that to? Uh, that was to uh, the addition of um, like Harding. I think it was Harding. Since what year? No, 2008, the addition of Fairchild Wheeler. Discovery, Harding, uh, uh, Harding changed. Uh, yeah, that kind of offset. Yeah, uh, it was a Fairchild Wheeler square Fairchild footage. Wheeler, that was, yep. that was new. So the next page, we give you an overview of everything by school. It gives you the square footage of the school, the year it was built, the year if there was any renovation done, the year the renovation was done, the acreage of the building, if there's an elevator, um, the staff count, um, which which ideally the first is the full staff count. We give you the current staff and then the delta, the current delta. Um, this has changed some. These numbers are um, a bit skewed from when we did the, this report. Uh, in this report, we show 19 and a half bodies down. Currently, we're in the 25 to 28 range right now. Um, that includes retirements um, and uh, compensation also. The full staff means custodial staff. Yes. Okay. The next page breaks down our management team, our support staff trades, the custodial staff and the logistics team uh, gives you a clear picture of everything. Uh, we've given you some historical data. Uh, for instance, in 2010, the management team had nine members on it. 2013, we had three. 2015, five, and currently we're at two uh, managers. Um, today was Bobby Hammond's last day. So Bobby Hammond was uh, playing the role of assistant director he had a career spanning 30 years. He spent 10 of those years at the Board of Ed. Um, you know, Bobby was a tremendous asset to the district. Uh, he took the district through COVID. You know, he's done a tremendous job. When I came in, he supported me wholeheartedly and uh, helped the transition be a smooth transition. And he played a vital role uh, up until today. So uh, it was a tough day for us all because, uh, you know, we're all family and facilities. So we wish Bobby the best in his uh, future endeavors. And uh, this is going to cause us to do a slight reorg that we're going to put in front of the superintendent in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, some of the duties that Bobby was overseeing will have to be split up amongst a few different folks, and there will be some role changes. Um, our support staff has changed dramatically also. 2010, 6, 13, we had 5, 15, 4, and 2022, we have 2. Um, one of those staff members... Uh, is not working out of payroll. They do our facilities payroll, but they're working out of the payroll office. They are off of our books. Um, the trade staff has, has changed drastically also. Uh, 2010, there were 25 and 13, 
15, 20.5, and in 2022, we're at 18.5 is the new number. Um, we are going to be hiring a new painter. That position is put in. Um, that'll supplement our current staff of one and a half. And then um, our custodial staff in 2010 was 186 and 13, 164, and 15, 171, and we're currently sitting at around 132. Um, the district really needs 169 custodians to run at full staff in order to cover all of its uh, current scheduling. We're gonna be looking at all of the buildings and uh, looking at the per square footage and the industry standards to see if we have any any available opportunities to sort of shrink the, the, the work schedules or to add additional duties to some, some additional schedules. But uh, that's a work in progress. The team's digging into that now. And I'll have a final or a draft rendition in the next few weeks. We've been having some conversations about trying to be a little bit more creative in order to add manpower, and not increase the budget, um, we have presented some ideas uh, to re labor relations to present to the um, collective bargaining agreement. Um, those in also include some possible part-time staffers to help, um, especially after hours when uh, the majority of the cleaning gets done. How many square feet? Is each it varies? Is each, no, is each man it varies responsible for it varies drastically from building to building. Um, so they're not so they're not all evenly. We have not been responsible to, for no. Uh, the, the the reasoning behind that is a few different factors: newer buildings, different textiles, um, equipment. Um, you know, so not every building is an apples for apples comparison when it comes to uh, drafting scheduling. Um, elevators, for instance, uh, so there's, there's it varies drastically from building to building. Our goal is to sort of have three buckets that we fit them into. Different vintages call for different square footage uh, levels per staff member. So uh, the team's working on that now. And, uh, you know, our goal is to start creating new scheduling before the new school year starts. Okay. The logistics team, this is a vital team on the uh, building operations staff. Uh, the logistics team is responsible for landscaping, uh, school to school moves, warehousing, you name it, this is the unit that does it all. Our goal was to beef them up and we had them up to eight staff members. Um, but we've had a few retirements, uh, folks moved on to different jobs and uh, we're down to three folks. We've got two guys on compensation. Uh, so this is really a difficult situation that they're in. The good news is that for the summer, we get some summer help through work uh, with the workplace. So we'll be able to offset some of those losses for the summer. Um, we're currently interviewing some folks to see if we can uh, find the right fit for the staff. But, you know, we're very, very. We're very focused on making sure we bring the right folks in, because if we don't bring the right folks in, we're just not able to get the things done in an efficient manner, in an efficient manner, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And over the years, you know, uh, the, the, the hiring process was just name, you know, you, you'd pull the name from HR and you'd hire them. Now we've got several layers of interviews with these folks to make sure that they understand what they're getting themselves into, what the responsibilities are, because this is a strenuous job. You know, from one day you're going to be lifting furniture in a classroom, mm -hmm. delivering boxes the next and then landscaping the day after that. So folks have to understand that it's a diverse job that that there's a lot of sweat and tears. In. So um, we're currently working on getting them to where they need to be. But there is a hardship there. We've broken down the trade staff by trade. You know, uh, carpenters, we currently have three. Electricians, we have four. Glazers, we have two. We have two masons currently. We have four HVAC. We have one one and a half painters with one more joining us uh, hopefully over the next week. We have one asbestos regulatory compliance guy, one plumber, believe it or not, um, one roofer. We have no drivers currently in the trades. Um, we currently don't have a clerk of the works and we don't have a supervisor directly uh, appointed to the trades uh, that okay. those positions were eliminated. We wanted to highlight the logistics team in this report because of the reverse amount of work that they do. Um, you know, they maintain all of the, the, the snowblowers throughout the district, um, all the landscape equipment. They do the landscaping themselves. 
Uh, they they do the payroll, board packets, mail, deliveries, um, inner school moves, school to school moves. These guys do it all. Um, you know, they they're really the backbone of the department. Some of the things that we like to see them do into the future is, uh, you know, picking up and delivering for the trades so the trades can stay on site because currently they have to do that themselves. So I'd love to get that windshield time down to a reasonable amount where, you know, we can have drivers go retrieve those items that they need on the fly and get them out to the school so they can stay on that job. Um, you know, so that's, that's that's right now in conversation on how we can make that happen, how we can adjust the staff and tweak things. Um, you know, we have a tremendous manager, Paul Washington, who's been with us for over 35 years. But, you know, when it comes to producing and getting things done, Paul just finds a way to get it done, even with minimal staff. Um, on to the next. We looked at the state. You know, we wanted to compare where we are um, with plant operations and maintenance costs. So Bridgeport in 2015, we're shy of 1,300. Um, in 2022, we're at 1,534. So there's been some gains on the amount of money spent on plants, on, on the facilities in the schools. And the state average is 1,700. So, you know, we've made gains over an eight-year span. So, you know, I feel like we're trending in the right direction. I also feel that as a department, we've got to find creative ways to realign our budget and make sure that we're finding every efficiency that we can through energy, through, um, you know, uh, the way that we're workloading, through the potential of part timers helping us to, to, to drive costs down in overtime. So the department is actively working on ways to make sure that we're not coming to the board or to Marlene, you know, our CFO and saying, you know, we need more money. We've got to really squeeze every aspect of our department to make sure that we're drilling things down as efficiently as possible. So these numbers help guide us a bit, you know, understanding where others are in the state and where we where we where we fall. So uh, some of our initiatives, um, we've got a very busy summer. Um, one of the biggest pieces of our summer is that we're going to be automating our custodial operations. So what does that mean? We're going to have modules for training and best practices. So every employee is going to take online uh, online course with a test on every aspect of cleaning a school facility. What this does is it gets everyone on the same page from any school, from school to school. They'll be on the same page. If we make a transfer, there's no uh, you know drop off in efficiencies because everything is going to be the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, what this also does it gives us a, a, a record of when this person was trained that they passed. If we see a deficiency in their work, we can have them retrained. And now we have a paper trail. Hmm. Folks that aren't up to the standard that we need them to be, you know, we've got to find a way to, to move on because the district at this size and the numbers that we have in staff, you know, it's important that the folks that are here with us are going to give us 100%. Another part of that is that we're going to have online Q&A. So quality assurance reports are going to be done online every day by the head custodian. They're going to be taking on 10 different areas, five to 10 different areas in a school, depending on the size. And they'll be doing this on their phone. And that report gets uploaded and we're going to have a dashboard. And we'll be able to see that in real time. That'll be done every single day by 830. Mm -hmm. And like that, we'll be able to grade each school. We'll be able to understand that if there's a deficiency in a school, management needs to step in, whether it's additional training. We, have, we need to look at the, the equipment that they have, their processes. This gives us a better ability to manage without having to physically be in every single plan every single day. But we're able to see everything every day. This is a powerful, a powerful tool for us. So we're currently undergoing this process now. We're also going to be automating our ordering. So everything's going to be everything's going to be done online. We've been trying to get this done for years. We're finally there. Uh, this gives us the ability to really understand where our stock is, gives us the ability to project out, make sure that you know we're not falling in a place where you know, we're low in a stock that's critical to the district, mm -hmm. but, you know, this gives Paul that ability to manage on a day-to-day -day basis with a lot with, with a lot less effort. Um, youth summer programming, um, you know, we're going to have these youth helpers uh, through the workplace. We currently are going to have six. Five are going to work within the trades and logistics team, and then we're going to have one working in the office helping us with um, filing. We're going to put them through some energy models and things like that that we have going. You know, we really want to make sure that these kids come in, they get something out of experience. And then we're going to work with the workplace to have an interview prep program, and then we're going to help them build a resume. So like that, when they're done with this program, they leave with something tangible. Um, we're looking at solar projects. Uh, Central 
Louis Marin and Geraldine uh, Clater. The roofs are fairly new. Um, you know, there's a lot of potential for us to gain in solar. And there's a lot of programs to help offset the cost. So Mike is going to be working on this along with the lighting upgrades. So currently uh, at our last meeting, we were approved to move forward with the MOU with UI. And uh, we're going to kick off four projects this summer. Um, and the goal is to get seven done before the end of this fiscal. So uh, we're estimating somewhere in a range of $250,000 of savings just through solar. So we're going to roll all of this in. And hopefully our goal is to save somewhere between 250, 350,000 this year. We're looking at the comprehensive programs with some of the chillers that we're going to be putting in place, like uh, a Tisdale. Tisdale's getting a lighting upgrade. So that's a comprehensive program that unlocks more money from, from UI. So, you know, this is our way of finding creative ways to, to put dollars back into the district and back into facilities. Um, this next page is an energy breakdown of what we did this past season. We saved a total of $315,000. Um, you know, it, it came with a little, <laughs> with a little pain and uh, some hard work, but you know, we're able to pull it off. We we did a substantial amount of work out there um, during COVID. You know, Bobby and Mike did a tremendous job of making sure they kept the guys working in a safe manner, and they really tackled a lot of outside lighting with LED. And then we came back through with the UI um, reimbursement program, eighty percent with the distressed cities, and we're able to hit the in interior schools. Um, we've got feedback from the schools that had lighting upgrades. They love the fact that it's brighter. They feel that, you know, it helps the kids stay awake and, and it just it makes things a lot better in the environment. Mm -hmm. School construction, we play a major role in school construction. Um, you know, we are involved in just about every meeting. We try to stay abreast of every decision made and make sure that it's in the best uh, best interest of the district. Um, you know, we've we've talked a lot about the fact that a school like Central, for instance, has an undersized chiller. We're making sure that with BASIC, that doesn't happen again. We put our foot down in terms of uh, any changes to the design theory behind the HVAC and mechanicals in these buildings. The MEPs are very important that when they design them, we get that original theory because that's going to give us the maximum output that we need to make sure that we are able to control that environment to the, to the most efficient level and give the students, the staff, the optimal learning environment. So in Harding, for instance, we're going to be engaging in the thermal loop. But with that, we made sure that we kept Bassett. our. What was that? Bassett. Bassett. I get these schools confused all day long. <laughs> um, you know, we made sure we kept the three boilers in because mm -hmm. if there's an issue, we need to have redundancy. So we built in additional pumps, made sure that we kept our boilers. Mm -hmm. There's a whole host of efforts that we made sure that uh, you know, remained in the design. And then training, uh, we discussed about how we're gonna train our custodial staff. We also have certifications going. We have uh, two classes done already, and we have two more this summer for SIM certification. It's a cleaning management institute certification. It's in all the best practices in the industry. It also covers COVID. Um, the only other organization that has all of their lead men certified in SIMS is Yale. So, you know, we uh, we really are proud of this effort and what we're doing. It's our way to make sure that our staff knows that we intend on investing in them. Um, it's important that they understand that they're part of the process and making sure we're giving them all the tools to succeed. Um, the logistics staff will constantly get trained on their, on their realm of work, chainsaw, wood chippers, lifts, you name it. Um, our, our trade staff will be trained in confined spaces, uh, make sure all of their OSHA is up to date. We're going to be doing an OSHA for the custodians, OSHA 10. We're going to offer OSHA 30 for those that like to take it. Um, you know, we want to build up the resumes and make sure that they feel good about what they're doing here. And then uh, our management team is undergoing the five behaviors of a comprehensive team. Um, we're on to our fourth level of this training, and we've got two more. Um, the, the team seems to be gravitating to it, and we're seeing advances in how we uh, communicate and operate through uh, utilizing this method. Um, but, you know, it's the first time that the team's been formally trained in about seven, eight years. So, you know, they, they were ready, and uh, they're really embracing it. Hmm. We're going to be doing our regular yearly uh, regulatory training, our bloodborne, and all of those good things. That's going to be rolled into the automated training that we have going for our staff. And then COVID, we're, you know, we're stocked. We're prepared for the upcoming season. Uh, you know, air purifiers are going to get all of their filters changed out on the on the schedule that we 
um, had laid out the the time that we discussed that in our one of our previous meetings. Um, you know, our filter changes for all our HVAC units are on, are on schedule. Um, they're working on those now. All the filters have come in for this change in August. Uh, they'll all be complete before school. So we're on task there. We're working closely with um, DEMAS, Department of Emergency Manage Management and Homeland Security, um, in terms of COVID kits. So we'll have the timing down to make sure that we have those in time for school. Um, and then ESSER, uh, you know, we're we're working hard on making sure that we're addressing the issues within our HVAC systems. You know, that's our largest call center. It's a place where not only can we make gains, but we can also save funding and make sure that we're creating the right environment. So one of the things is it's it, it comes with pain, right? Because we can easily do things to bypass things and give someone cooling right now. But, you know, we've sort of taken a step back. We're making sure we're doing our preventative maintenance and all of our PMs and doing all of those things. So we put that new chiller in. The system works properly. We currently have a controls vendor in. They started at JFK. We're going to go through every single data point in the building to make sure it's operational. That'll ensure that when we log into our of building management systems, we're able to manipulate and see what's going on in those buildings. So we started that practice. Um, our goal is to get through the top five this summer and they'll work into the school year also. So we feel we're making those gains. Um, we had a hang up on the chiller at Tisdale School. It was supposed to be in the first week of June. Um, it got kicked out to August. Um, the second week of August, I'm not confident. We bought in a temporary chiller to make sure that we are able to control that environment. They have summer school and several programs there. I want to make sure that when the kids come back to school, if the chiller hasn't been delivered, that they have the cooling they need. So we're making provisions to make sure that we're staying ahead of things and addressing the issues before they become uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of asbestos work going on through ESSER. We've shut down Park City Magnet, JFK, and Reed. They're getting substantial work done. Reed is getting all of their ceiling tiles on the first floor removed and replaced, and their tile on the first floor is being removed and replaced. We're also doing a lighting upgrade in Reed School. That's going to be the first school that's going to be done. Park City Magnet, uh, asbestos tile on the second floor is being replaced, and by the back trailers is being replaced. Um, that's going to be replaced with uh, regular tile. Reed is going to be replaced with LVT, which is luxury vinyl tile. That's the tile that doesn't have to be stripped and waxed. Mm -hmm. So it's a home run, drives down the, the need for uh, resources that we can put in other areas. So, you know, we're, we're finding innovative ways and we're, we're utilizing best practices to drive down costs and uh, the need for resources. Um, you know, we've got designs that I should have in the next week or two for AC at Cross and AC at Columbus and the Chiller at Batala. Those got hung up a bit in the city attorney's office uh, for contracting. Um, but, you know, we're finally to the point that, you know, we're going to see these designs and now we can go to bid for these things and get a good understanding of what the costs are and utilize ESSER funding to get those done. Water, water, water bottle fill stations will be completely installed for the school year. I think we're down to the last two or three at this point. So, uh, you know, it was an initiative that the superintendent wanted, to, wanted us to make sure that we got on done. That's going to be complete. Then we're going to do an additional review for some of the larger schools and add fill stations where needed. Um, pointing work was done throughout the district this uh, past season. Um, we just finished up the final project over at Madison. Um, uh, some soffit work um, in the parapet was sort of a sponge and it was absorbing a lot of water and getting into the building. That's now watertight. And then uh, chiller renewal. So we're working with um, Train, who has a lot of equipment in the school district. Um, and we've worked out some new contracts to make sure that, you know, we have a better grip on what's going on. So we can have our techs focus in on our problems and let the professionals that install that equipment maintain the equipment to a certain level. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is we have chiller renewals. They come in, they gut the chiller, they reestablish it, they give us a new serial number, then we have five-year warranty on these. So that gives us the ability to call them in to get that work done so our guys are freed up to, to, to really key in on those individual issues within the buildings. Um, and uh, Fairchild Wheeler, I believe, is underway. We also have, um, we're doing a major job at Barnum Waltersville. We're, we're uh, cleaning the energy wheels. These energy wheels really help control the environment within the building. We've had some environmental issues in there with some moisture in the summers. So these energy wheels should help solve that problem. And then we have some head end issues in terms of the server on site. So we're working to do that now. Their Siemens system, it's one of those disparate systems that we're trying to draw back into our control. And then we'll start to really key in on, on those issues within that building. Um, but that's our stewardship report. Okay. Any questions? 
Yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Garcia, for always, you know, give us the report completely, not the way it is. I, I don't see another staff that you do a report complete like you, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, you say I'm almost to complete um, custodian for all schools at around 170. Yes. Right, so complete. Um, why are the reasons getting low staff? Is it because they live in, they live in for because they want to, or because they don't like the job? It's a few oh, different factors. Uh, a few different factors. I mean, other towns are paying substantially more than Bridgeport. Um, you know, sometimes two to six dollars more an hour. Um, the district over time, it's just you know the budget shrink and facilities has been at you know the catalyst of some of the savings. Um, you know, and you know, listen, the superintendent's leadership has been important for us to sort of reestablish ourselves. When we were in dire straits, he he was able to get us ten maintainers. For the district that helped us in logistics that helped us at the school level um but you know there is also an issue of hiring folks you know we're interviewing you know three four folks a week trying to find the right candidates we're not gonna we're not gonna bend you know we have a need but at the same time we also have a need for high level folks that want to really come to bridgeport and do the right thing and we have a focus on bridgeport folks you know i'd love to see us create a path for even high school uh, students that when they graduate, if they don't want to go to college, let's get them into a work program. You know, something that we wanted to do this summer, we just couldn't get to it. You know, there's a lot of work, um, you know, so we're hoping that with some of the efficiencies we gain through some of these projects that we're going to embark on in the summer, we're going to have that time next year to create that work program so we can start to get these students in on a seasonal basis and then hire the ones that really fit and want to work. Right. That's important to us, you know. Uh, we used to do this back in the day, and we'd love to really get to that again. Uh, I have been working with some high school uh, principals, and, and, you know, I've gotten some students that we're interviewing. We've got several interviews when I come back from vacation with some high school students that may be able to help us and join the staff on a seasonal basis. And if they fit, then maybe on a permanent basis. Thank you. And you were talking about the training. I'm very um, 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 talk about the training of the custodians. The question, let's say you have uh, uh, equipment or equipment A, I'm gonna give an example, equipment A, and you training the custodian because the equipment A, and then that's Monday, Tuesday, and then Friday, they come at another equipment B. Yep. You have to train in again after you training the equipment A, yep. because I know it's very important that you got custodians. Yep. They say, because, oh, because I got 20, 25 years, 30 years, I'm not gonna move this, I got priority, this, and stuff like that. And sometimes it's a lot of things behind yep. because the custodians sitting down there, some like to work, some the other ones they're lazy, some to one day other oh, I'll do whatever I want. And that's not that's not fair. I see sometimes staff they had to do custodian's job. Yeah. And that's not I don't I don't find that fair. You know, and my question for you is the training of the custodians, you know, how everything will be working, everybody be on the same page. Not because you got priority, because you got 10, 15 years, you know, and working with Bristol School, you know, and necessary to take the training or you take it because you don't, you know, have no choice. So I, I see this from, we're going to attack that from two different ways, right? We're going to attack that from, we're, we're going to get everyone on the same page. doesn't matter if you're here 15, 20 years or 15 days, right? We're all here to do a job. That's the core work that we're here to do, right? So we're going to make sure that everyone's on the same page to do this training, right? If there is a deficiency and we see that there's a deficiency, then we can have them retake the training and then we have the ability to do in services with these folks. So we're going to make sure that we give them every opportunity to succeed. Now, how the second piece of that is when our head custodians do their inspections, if we start to see a deficiency in a specific schedule and a specific role within that schedule, then we can key in on that. So by leveling the playing field and making everyone equal, by getting them all onto the same page, it gives, it gives us the ability to manage at a different level. Because now we don't have to we don't have to manage these different pockets throughout the district. And I think you're going to see with the fact that we're hiring the right folks now, right? We're making sure we're bringing in the top level folks and we're training them, right? We're giving them the latest equipment. We're, you know, we're bringing in a new chemical line. It's, it's, the, it's between one and two in, in, in the world, Spartan. We're giving them the best chemical on the market. And we're making sure that when we bring in new equipment that head custodians are certified in it. So they can now train their staff. You know, we're giving them the tools to succeed. And now we have the ability to see what's going on through these Q&As to really understand if the head custodian fits. Right. 
because unfortunately, you know, just because you took a test doesn't mean that you can do the job, you know? So we have to be able to have a method and a metric to hold these, these folks to. And these uh, Q and A's is going to really help us with that, you know? So, you know, we want to hold everyone accountable the same, you know, there's no favoritism. There's, there's none of that anymore. It's, 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 let's come to work, do our job. We're going to support you. We're going to make sure you got the equipment, the uniforms, the training, the tools. And if you don't have something you need, you can call me 24 seven. We're going to make sure that we get you what you need because that's what this district needs. You know, we really got to make sure that the folks feel like they're part of what's going on here and that they're part of the solution. I think there's one thing also that Mr. Garcia may have overlooked. Um, we began probably in the last quarter of the year to support Mr. Garcia and his efforts to hold staff accountable because some of the issues he was encountering was log jams um, in different offices from preventing him to be able to discipline uh, not only accurately, but timely. And now, so we meet biweekly um, in my office, the facility, Mr. Garcia um, and Mr. Hammond with the HR department so that any issues he may be having with uh, a discipline, a suspension or anything can be immediately addressed. So there's no more lapses where he's recommended somebody to be disciplined. And three months later, that person still hasn't been disciplined and it hasn't gone to labor relations and everyone else is looking around saying, well, they got away with that. So now what gives me the incentive to work hard when Mr. Sokolovic, he, he got caught sleeping or leaving early 15 nights and <laughs> nothing happened to him. So I'll leave early. So because of that, now everything seems to be much more efficient. It takes a, a lot off for him because he doesn't have to follow up now every couple of days. What's going on with Mr. Skolvik? What's going on with Mr. Weldon? It's every two weeks we have the meeting. People leave with their marching orders. Uh, labor relations is included in that meeting. This way we're all on the same page. That was a game changer for us because things started moving. Um, you know, listen, we want to support the staff. And if there is the bad apple, we have to address it. I mean, we have a dedicated group of folks out there that really want to do what they what they what they're intended to do here in the district. But you know, over time and budgets change and things change and COVID and all these things, you know, we needed to reorganize and, and reinvigorate and remotivate. You know, and right now I just feel like the staff is really Kicking into high gear, I got out to about six schools today. I drove myself a little, a little crazy, but, you know, I wanted to get out there and talk to the staff. And, you know, I'm very happy to see what's going on out there. I mean, they're they're really kicking into high gear. I got guys waxing cafeterias or stripped and ready to go when, you know, classrooms done. And, and, I mean, it just looks good, the activity. It makes me feel good about what we're doing here. And it's important for the staff to see that, you know. So, you know, we meet quarterly with the head custodians, you know, to go over where we are. State of the Union. Let them know about the budget. Let them know where we are with, with our activities, you know, what we intend on doing, because it's important that they give us feedback. We always give them a QA and a time, and it's the old bar. You know, I want to know what's going on. But at the same time, we have an open door policy. You know, if someone has a question, it doesn't matter if you're a janitress, a maintainer, a custodian one, two, three, four, a supervisor one, our door is always open. We, we want to make sure that folks, if they want to meet face to face, that they can call Patty and, and arrange a meeting. Because that's important. People need to be heard. And not every great idea comes from management. Some of the greatest things that we've done as a district have come from the ranks. But we need them to be able to feel comfortable to give us that information. Because they live it every day. You know, it's about the boots on the ground. We help support them, but they do that work. You know, they're, they're the real champions. Um, <clears throat> another, I want to ask you something, uh, Mr. Garcia. Thank you for the information. What's going on with this custodian? They always complain to move something. Let's say if you can move this table, I believe, if you believe it's a heavy, strong table and that custodian cannot move it, I know he will ask for help. But sometimes you got custodian that like, oh, I'm not going to move that table. Leave it there and then time pass and nothing happened. I will call that person lazy. That's the word. And we don't, we don't want that because and then the staff is going to communicate with the principal and then you're going to receive an email. Mr. The going to receive an email. What's going on with this custodian sometimes? They dare. They, they think because they got years. And, and that's the mindset we're trying to break by by equalizing the play of the playing field. You know, I mean, that's that's what it's all about, you know, because because once we level that playing field, we can see exactly what's going on with those staff members. And then we're going to counsel them and we're going to work with them. But eventually we're going to move on from them. You know, that's important. And, you know, through the leadership of the superintendent and, and getting departments together to be able to unlock log jams, 
now people understand that we're serious about what we say when we say you you have to do peace. We don't want people to come here and and you know we're not gonna we're not gonna make you do anything you're not supposed to. We just want you to come in, do your job. We're gonna support you. We want you to feel comfortable and be safe so you get home to your family. That's the goal. But we need everybody to step up and do their thing, and we're working on that every day. My last one question for you is, and I know this for you guys before I was a board member. What's going on with the Cesar Batalla, the AC? <laughs> it's a nightmare. It's, it's always an issue. And I have a, um, they come to my attention something that I believe when Rita Sanchez was there, it was a grant to do it for the soccer field, but they used that grant. I don't know if you was here for that time. They used it for the AC for the Cesar Batalla. And then, um, and, and then I can clarify the soccer field. And not finish, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. And then I don't know what happened. The point is they always, issue with the AC and it says what is not old school it's not too old and it's always now lighthouse is coming you know it's hot so and then I went on only to the office and I see the secretary sweating I'm like wow what's going on here so I can tell you about Batala Batala is one of those schools that the design was gutted from the original theory they put in ice storage in the building Mixed reviews, they did it anyway. It was against the recommendation of facilities at the time. Um, ice, the ice storage never worked. We went over to chillers. Um, but, you know, the system wasn't designed to, it was designed to carry 60% of that massive facility. And when you walk into its giant cavern of, of, of huge ceilings and everything else, I mean, you know, we got to be realistic when we design, because if not, we get what we have in Batala. So what are we doing in Batala? We utilize the, the assessment that we got from HBAC to go in and start fixing the issues that we were able to see from the 30,000 foot view assessment. Now we're digging in. I've had a, a technician there. We have uh, a refrigerant issue that we're dealing with right now. Um, there's a couple sensors that we're having issues getting. Uh, Train was gracious enough to send us three sensors from their stock. Mm -hmm. Working through it. But the biggest issue there is the chiller. We've oversized the upcoming chiller and the design that I'm going to be reviewing in the next week or so. That'll be going out to bid. Our intent was to get that done and the potential of getting it done this summer, but there was a lot, Jen, and our contracts took an exorbitant amount of time. Um, you know, but we've worked through that and, you know, we've had meetings and things are starting to happen. Um, you know, but we're, we're at the mercy of a few things, right? We're at the mercy of other departments that have to do their piece and we're at the mercy of lead times because the lead times are exorbitant. Um, you know, we got lead times on VFDs for uh, Fairchild Wheeler. It was 20 weeks out. Um, we started working on chillers for next summer now. Um, you know, we're gonna be doing three additional chillers the upcoming season. We started that work now because of what we're seeing in the industry. We wanna make sure we get ahead. Um, we're working on heating. We had a meeting on heating the other day, as crazy as it sounds, because we gotta get ahead. I know that I need burners at Winthrop. I know I wanna add a supplemental boiler to Allen. I know that you know, I need to add another boiler to black them. We're working on that stuff now. Those bids are going to be going out over the next week or so. All the documentation is done. We're in a review phase of that stuff. But the industry has really put a damper on a lot of what we want to do this summer. You know, and the fact that it's not only the commodity, it's also the resource. There's a lot of understaffed departments. There's a lot of industry uh, manufacturers that are understaffed. And we're dealing with the ramification of all of that. But, you know, in some instances, things are getting better. We see that furniture that was way out there is starting to come in at a reasonable rate. Uh, lumber and things like that are starting to become come down to reality from where they were. But anything with a chip, it's difficult. I would appreciate I know you're not God, but I know you always do. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do the most you can and you do your job the way that they say. Great team. Happy. I know you. I know you fight and you trying to do the best you can. And I hope this, you know, you can help and fix that situation in Bataya because it's bad. We are working. Damn. I know you are. We've, we've had a technician planted there. I know you are. He can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> but, but to his point on page nine, as you could see, the design work for the upcoming projects was Cross, Columbus, and Bataya. The date on this is February 24th. So we had expected to do that work this summer. Unfortunately, the contracts were held up in the city attorney's office for a significant period of time. We finally got things moving because we've now brought in Bertram and Moses, had a meeting with the city attorney's office so that we can send some of our contracts to our attorneys to start the process. 
So since we've had that meeting in the last three or four weeks, we've been able to push through. But that was supposed to be happening right now. Yeah. I mean, that's why February, we were ready to go. Yeah. Is it because the money or because they... The attorney's so short-handed yeah. and they have so many contracts they need to review. Who's going first, the city contracts or the board of ed contracts? We were put to the side. Because of the ESSER allotment allowing that we could pay for um, legal services out of the grant, we're now utilizing some of the funds to have our folks look at it. So Rich Paterla has been pushing stuff through, contracts through over the last three or four weeks since. It's been tremendous. I, I mean, I couldn't loud, let, yell any louder yeah. when it came to what are we doing, what are we doing? And finally, you know, we got something. It's sad because the city contract, the contract of the city had the AC. It's suffering right now. It, our student and our staff. So I hope, you know, we and on, get to the top of that. And on the soccer field, the grant that was written uh, by the assistant principal when Mr. Sanchez was there for, was for $250,000. So two and a, almost three years ago when I started, um, we got a notification from the state that we had to expend the money by a certain date. So we had three months left or the money was gonna have to be given back. So the original company out of Brantford, it was before you came on, out of Brantford, who had quoted us that they would be able to do the field for $250,000. When we went back to them, um, they did some preliminary site work at $10,000 and then said the cost of the field was gonna be significantly higher. So at that point, there was no way we were going to get the field done, and we had to give the money back to the state. So the grant was not spent on the air conditioning. We gave it back, and we never paid the company the $10,000 because we found out they misrepresented their ability to do the work. They were going to sub it out to a third party. So the money went back to the state. They they did not get paid, and no harm, no foul. All right, thank you for your clarification. I appreciate that. No more questions, no more comments, Mr. Chair. Okay, Mr. Macaron. Any questions? I'm I think good. you're muted. I'm you're good. good. I, just think, I just think Mr. Garcia has done a great job, and I really, I really uh, am um, uh, impressed at what you've told us tonight. Thank you. It's a, it's a complex operation. Absolutely. To say the least. Mr. Scully, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, just basically one. Um, one. About the um, trainings, uh, does any of them lead to like certifications or licensure? And is there any way to keep them restricted? Because uh, like when people don't get licensed on our dime and go to another district. No licensing, there will be some certifications. The way I see it is if folks are leaving here and they got opportunity elsewhere, that means we're breeding the best. Our goal is to find the right pipeline and develop the programs where we're getting the right staff and, right. and we're working on that daily. I, I mentioned that because of our um, retention issues and um, my old job in New York City Transit Authority, they would um, license people to drive the forklift, yep. but it was only valid on site. Yeah. So they couldn't, they couldn't just get trained on a forklift and then yeah. suit out somewhere else. We're trying to develop a, a, a culture where folks want to come to work and be happy. And, you know, they're going to tell the people that they know they work in a great place and they're going to help us draft the folks that we need. All right. I think that does it for the stewardship report. Next is a facilities condition report of Hall and Edison Elementary School. So, as everyone is aware, there's been discussions in previous years and previous administrations about looking at the facilities as a cost saving measure. Um, Mr. Garcia and I have had several conversations. We've also gone on site and walked the buildings together, as well as with um, some of his leadership team in looking at it from a programmatic standpoint. Um, what we find to be problematic is that it is not an appropriate building programmatically to continue forward with, with children. For example, at Hall School, if you want to call it a gymnasium, you can call it the space they continue to use as a gymnasium. Number one is small. Number two, it has metal poles going right down the middle. Um, so there are some safety hazards, but it's also restrictive of what you can do in terms of physical education. Um, 
There are one, there's one boys room, one girls room, both located in the basement. Again, you, it's a K-6 school. The majority of kids cannot just go to the bathroom on their own. So that takes time away from instructional time to bring either the entire class or have somebody be able to walk another student, a buddy system. Then when you walk through the building, you'll see the old radiators, which get extremely hot or caged in with metal cages. Um, they try to put foam um, padding to prevent any kids from getting hurt on the edges. Um, there's sinks, supply uh, slop sinks um, in the middle of the hallway. We can't do anything about that. There's storage cages in the middle of the hallway that store um, custodial supplies and chemicals that he, uh, George explained uh, to me that if we try to move them into other areas of the building, the fire marshal will violate us. So everything has to stay status quo. Um, so you have a school that has, is number one, under enrolled, both of them. A number two, they don't have the physical attributes of any of the newer buildings uh, or even some of the buildings that were built um, in the middle of the 20th century. So as you can go back to Edison was built in 1935, all school 1914. So you have between the two schools, you have over 90,000 square feet and the enrollment together is not even 300 kids, maybe slightly above 300. I've got the current enrollments. Um, all the current enrollment is uh, 162, which is a 40% utilization. Uh, in 2009, they were at 263. Um, at Edison, the current enrollment is 181, which is right around 40%. Um, you know, you have feeder schools uh, like Dunbar. Capacity is at 750. They're at 358. Tisdale, 750. They're at 533. And then, you know, looking at Edison, um, you know, Beardsley's capacity is 500. They're at 300. Hooker's at 550. They're at 272. So there is the need for us to sort of look at the district from that lens. Um, there's the need for capital outlay in both those buildings, substantial capital. That's amortized over 20 years. We're not going to get 20 years out of these buildings. The programs just don't fit. Um, all need, for instance, um, there's, we're maxed out in power in both buildings. So there's no additional capacity. So you can't bring in any new technology. Uh, both lots need to be repaved at around 250,000. New playgrounds at each are outdated, need replacement at around 100,000. Um, there's, a, there's a need for a second boiler at Edison. Uh, I mean, at a uh, hall school, um, Edison needs a new roof. They have trailers that need to be demoed in both buildings. Um, there's a substantial amount of issues at, at both facilities. Both facilities, you know, you know, I, I talked to Mike today. I said, you know, how many work orders do we get? And he says, well, believe it or not, we don't get a ton because there's no, there's nothing in these buildings. Right. But, um, the condition and the fact that the program really, is stretched at this point. You know, we've really got to look at this uh, from a facility standpoint. You know, we'd love to see the decommissioning of the buildings, being able to take that staff and and, and utilize it elsewhere. And it's not a matter only of the forty percent being space, because of the um, the population. That's the number of kids in those neighborhoods that are districted to go to those schools. So these are just large classrooms that have very few children. Um, and I think the biggest component to this is obviously, you know, the technological upgrades that can't be done. The physical, you know, education program is, is not very good. Um, you know, in poor weather in the winter time, there's nowhere for kids to go. There's no place to go for recess. I mean, cafeterias are, I, I think at all the best Part of the building is possibly the cafeteria <laughs> space, but it's in the basement. There's no ventilation, low ceilings. Low ceilings. Um, I mean, it's, it's not a, a warm and welcoming place for for kids to attend school. I think that's every kid in the district. If we're going to look at it from an equitable standpoint, deserves a, a warm, welcoming, um, state of the art as best as possible. I mean, in some of the older buildings like Black and Park City Magnet and those schools, we've done enough and the physical plant itself allows us to at least make it somewhat comparable. But these buildings, there's nothing we can do. 
and there's a substantial investment that's on the horizon that, uh, as George mentioned, we're not going to get 20 years out of it. I don't think we're going to get 10. The other um, issue that we have is the state is honest about um, being non-compliant, ADA. You know, we're not, you know, there's just, we have these issues and they're threatening the whole money back, you know, because we're not addressing these ADA issues. But, you know, to, to invest the kind of money to, to bring these up to ADA is astronomical. You know, and it's not the best money spent. To that point, they have cited us on some of these buildings when we come up to do roof projects and other capital projects. At some point, they're going to say enough is enough. We're not going to continue to reimburse you on these projects if you do not um, bring them up to ADA. Today. And uh, I'm, I'm worried that that day is coming soon. Um, there has been change of, of leadership and operations, as we all know, at the school construction office. Um, they keep asking for more and more paperwork in terms of reimbursement on the most recent roofs that we've done throughout the district. And that includes Marin and schools that don't have ADA issues. So I think, you know, as we try to push the issue, these other buildings, I don't think they're going to get approval at the state level. Um, and if they do, it's going to take, uh, it's going to take a lot of, of convincing that we have no other options when. They have our enrollment numbers. You have other options that I think would be viable to bring kids and other buildings that I think parents will be much, much more happy. So this, so this is not an issue that's limited to just Hall and Edison. Well, from what it sounds like you just said. No, it's not an issue. There, there are other, other buildings in the same set of circumstances correct that, there. that i think we can buy some time with because there are and could potentially be a remedy for example there is enough property at park city magnet that we could build a new school there um skein school we were just there this morning walking there there needs to be significant upgrades for skein um CSA, but CSA has a plan. Yeah, we do have a plan now for classical studies. Thank God. That's but the that's, oldest. That's the oldest school in the district, right. and that's only because we're building a new BASIC and we have the option of bringing them into uh, where BMA is currently located. But we don't have any swing space, and if we don't start any, there's no way we're going to be able to meet the needs of a, a construction project at Blackham School with 1,110 kids currently enrolled. There's just nowhere to put 1110 kids while you renovate as new over 18 to the 24 months. Whenever that project John Winthrop needs to get done at some point. So I think you guys need to put together some sort of a. Facilities replacement or merger plan. Oh, well, I think what we should do is embark on a facilities master plan. That, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. And that's that's a big one because that's that that encompasses every department. But I think at this point we haven't done one. I want to say it was like it was 2000. I think. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago. And and this will really help us make the case to the city that you know we need an investment in, in our facilities, and it can really call out where, why, when, and and have all the data to support it all. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of costly and and time consuming, well, but it's time. About two years ago, I want to say the. The mayor's office wanted to do that. They did. We had, had that a meeting, meeting and then kind of COVID hit. And so I think you need to re-engage them because they're the ones who are going to be able to, you know, go to bat at the state level. We will do that. We also should. And, and PJ and data management has invested in some software that we can start moving lines if we need to look at redistricting as well. It's another component to this. That probably the first component is redistricting a little bit because it can all offset some of our overcrowdedness and some of our under enrolled schools. For example, Johnson is busting at the seams and Columbus, a couple of blocks away, literally um, has has room. Mm -hmm. So that has to be looked at. So I think he can move the lines digitally. See where it correct. And, you know, you also have some of these companies like uh, Malone and Malone and, and others out there that will do some projections mm -hmm. based on birth rates, based on housing trends and things like that, that can predict out 10 years and help contribute to um, a district master facilities. 
Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, Ms. Cressy, I know, like I said, you're not God, but I know you can do a miracle. <laughs> Um, I know whole school is we've talking about 108 years, 108 years, and we're talking Edison is 87 years. And I really visit the school years back and it's terrible. Special the stairs when you go upstairs is bad. And together I see it's like a 90,377, you know, square. Put it together. What is the next plan, you know, to be sure we have a nice school for that? You know, I think it will be I know years back we did talk about that. It was the most issue. Parents come out, they don't want to call the school. But now we were talking about the safety of the student and the staff. You know, parents have to see that. And now I went and I see it. It's, it's, it's bad. I think I think there's short term and long term solutions. I think, you know, redistricting, maybe uh, the short term. I think the long term is the facilities master plan. Um, you know, we'd like to get through the summer. We start the conversation now. Maybe midway through the summer, we can start embarking on a facilities master plan. Um, you know, I think we'll have the the, the bandwidth to start that. Um, you know, I'd have to dedicate staff to that probably full time. Um, you know, just because it is a monster lift. But you know, uh, PJ has set up, set up the district in a way where it really streamlines a lot of what the the master plan is going to need. So that really helps bring down the time frame of getting something turned around and in front of the city, in front of the board. Um, but you know. We can re-engage with the city and start to have that conversation. And if they're willing to help fund that, I mean, we yeah. can. And you brought up a good around. point because I didn't even mention the stairwells. You know, <laughs> they are extremely dangerous. Yes. I am surprised. You have to take it. You have to go like the side so you can take the stairway. Yeah, you that, 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 very was, badly. that was not even, I mean, yep. I took some pictures and I'll forward them to all of you um, from our visit a few weeks ago. But the stairwells are very narrow, very steep. Um, Especially the, the challenging, especially the principal's office. It looked like a storage. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's no something she can read or window. Nothing is something so small. tie only one person can get in. So what's the closet? Yeah. Unfortunately. But uh, you have another schools like I talk about. Let's see. I'm talking about so we can be in the same situation today. Oh, like our Brian schools, 1912. <laughs> we got Madison, 1916. And, you know, remember one classical horse at the whole point. We got BLC 1895, you know, some school, they all, I know they had to be checking, you know, just in case you working with Edison um, whole school, but the budget, it will be good to check this school just in case the budget we can include them just in case. Madison's had some work. Yeah, Madison had a renovation. Madison's actually in fairly good condition. They've got an elevator was put in as part of the renovation. Yeah. And I see the elevator. Yeah. We've done some substantial work since I've been back to make sure that the envelope of the building it's watertight and, um, you know, I feel like we can turn the corner on Madison through some strategic investments. Um, but some of these older buildings, like you mentioned, you know, we really got to focus in on the facilities master plan. It helps us in two ways. It gives us a long range vision of where we're going, helps the district prepare for the future. But it also solves our state issue with the compliance, right, because now we're committed to doing something. Um, you know, we've got some roof projects that we want to start to bid off for next season. Uh, you know, we don't want to end up in, in red tape due to the fact that we don't have a plan on how to address these issues. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that, you know, we should start moving in that direction. I'm, I, will, I will let you know, because sometimes I got parents that have concerns about safety of all the, you know, all their kids and other kids. Sometimes I visit school and me and Mr. Russell, we go and see the situation, you know, and you know, I will let you know, listen, Mr. Garcia, find that, check this, what's going on in the school, you know, because sometimes about the safety of it. And we, I told you that one is the situation, the custodians, they see stuff like that and do not report it. That's so why we have to wait a parent call me or call somebody or call me Mr. Destani when the custodian is supposed the first one report that and then you know and make it a uh, policy or protocol, whatever they have to do, inform it in a in an email. So and we're gonna tighten that all up. Yeah. You know, we're gonna make sure that that gets all addressed. You know, and the other issue he mentioned is Beardsley. Um wasn't as big an issue until they allowed that uh, Pet Boys, is it Pet Boys? Auto mm -hmm. Zone to be built. Boy. Now it becomes problematic because there's a shared driveway that goes to the back, which is really dangerous. Oh, yes. Terrible. Um, Terrible. Yes. So another school that we should pop, you know, rather than try to send kids from from um, Paul and Edison to Beardsley, we do have other, other options. Um, we're not going to send all our kids who are new to the district anymore to Marin and Batalla. 
uh, that come from from out of the country. You know, they're going to provide support in their neighborhood schools. So the Marin enrollment should be dropping significantly over the next couple of years. So we'll be able to absorb more neighborhood kids if we redistrict a little bit into that building and maybe look to um, to, to get out of Beardsley as well. To your point about parents, it's important because the feedback we listen. You know, we 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 like to get out. I mean, me, me and the superintendent, we're out at JFK. We had a meeting with the parents. We want to hear what's going on and what's some of our heartaches. The the Park City Magnet Project, the asbestos removal on the second floor, was started because of concern from a parent that we went out, we looked at it, we agreed that there was an issue that needed to be addressed, and we put a plan around it. So listen, we encourage everyone to 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 tell us what's going on in the district. The more information and data we have, the faster we can turn things around. And more easy, the safety for everyone. You see what happened one day in Beardsley School. I went with the parents. I went with me to the restaurant, and when there was something in the middle yep. about safety, hazard, and that what that I did. I call you. I send you the proof, and I know you fix it right away because, like I told you, some custodians see stuff there, and they're like, uh, "Okay, I'll do whatever next day, next day." And that's not fair because we don't want something happen. That's what they move. Park City issue. Parent, dad called, reached out to me. Um, we, we talked about it. We shut it down for the summer. We kicked Lighthouse out and said, you know, sorry, but, but this is a priority and it's getting done. But, you know, those are the things that have to be brought forth. And we take the advantage of the shutdown and do substantial painting and a whole host of other work. And, you know, I mean, the guys feel good about that work, too, by the way. You know, our trades guys, when they get into a building and they get to really use their craft and look back at what they did, those are the moments that make the job worth it, you know? So those are things that we love to do. Anything, if I were business school, something like that, I will let you know so you can be sure because the safety of our staff and students. That's a good point. No more questions. Mr. Macaron, anything? No questions. Okay. Mr. Kolovic, anything? Yeah, a couple. Um, how many schools do we have under 50% enrollment? It's hard to say because um, it, it, some of the, the space over time has been reallocated for, for office space and things like that. But I mean, if you want to really look at probably about a half a dozen are, are solidly under enrolled. You know, Hooker, as he mentioned, is under enrolled because that building hasn't changed and there always was significantly more students. Dunbar, at one point prior to the, the build of Tisdale, when McKinley was there, was in its heyday, had over 700 kids in that physical plant. Um, Paul Edison, Beardsley, um, trying to say legitimately if, I think that those are the rules. Yeah, yeah those, are the, those are the top. Right. Schools that are, you know, severely under enrolled and and problematic for other reasons. Um, we are helping reduce the stresses on Tisdale because Tisdale has there. Technically, the building would hold more. But we have over the years have put a lot of specialty special needs classrooms there, um, especially medically fragile and things like that. So. You take that into consideration. Um, they could use <clears throat> some of a, a lesser enrollment, and we've tried to not send as many kids anymore. We're not allowing transfers um, just from Dunbar over. Uh, it's just not fair. But, we'll, but we have put a lot of effort into put upgrading things, and, and we actually looked into painting the exterior of, of Dunbar to make it look more appealing. Um, that was one of the things that I hope to get done and just found from the professional painting companies that 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 brick is not worth the effort to try to paint. Right. Can, can we look at like some parallel and um, parallel plans, like maybe at another school or something, because we are going to face a budget crisis coming shortly. And so the maintenance staff, if we're just speaking strictly on maintenance, is being stretched out more and more square feet, reducing our facilities not only save money on plant and maintenance, it would also allow staff to concentrate more in certain buildings, not only not only with maintenance, but with um, in a perfect world, fully financed school system. I wouldn't even have to mention this. We would um, 
can reallocate all our staff to other schools and have all the services because there's a lot of the trouble is and the expenses is bringing the services to the kids rather than bringing the kids to the services. Right. And there could there could be a lot more specialization done. Yeah, and it, and it's sad to stay. And I want I want to caution uh, that this work has got to be done over a good period of time. There's a lot of um, essentially right now only talking about the two schools, yeah. but there's processes to go through that last a long time. Community and community forums or what have you. I do, I don't recall all of the steps you got to go through, but it is significant. It's not just. It is. I was going to bring the document and I forgot to grab it. <laughs> yeah, the process. That's why we're having the conversation now, because if we're going to um, make a decision, that's not these two uh, for 23-24. Um, that, that has to start immediately when we come back in the fall in, um, in notifying folks and giving them an opportunity. But it just can't be, please know, because I can, I, it's, you know, my, that's the school across the street that, that where I live for my, my son, it's convenient. But is it the right program? And they're K-6 schools. So, you know, it, it's nice to have that. But we also know the transiency of the population that they're not kids that stay there for seven years um, because people move around the city so often. So we have to take that into consideration as well. Absolutely, yeah. In a perfectly funded world, see the new building over there for the kids. And uh, yeah, I don't think that shift to anybody. Everybody have a neighborhood school right close to their house. They'd allow us to do no. knock it down. It's not enough acreage. Yeah, to build it's not enough acreage. The state would the state wouldn't allow it. So you'd have to do some sort of renovation. It gets very very tricky to try to make it fit. Um, you know, I just I think it's time. It's time. And yeah, that's all I got. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would ask that you uh, re-engage the city on this topic, the mayor's office. They were up for it. They wanted to do it just like they did 20 years ago. Because it'll take 10 years to cycle through. Yeah. And build yeah. all the new yeah. schools. And yeah. that the, the, 20, the 2000 master plan is what gave us Italia. Clater and all these other schools, and it takes a good ten, maybe fifteen years. And now this is the other side of the district, which needs to be addressed. So I would get that going. Yeah, and the like I said, the Blackham situation is is going to be the key, because the location of the school is is perfectly situated for that for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But so those kids would have to go somewhere while it. You have to find a way to. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Garcia. Thank you for having. And uh, yeah, let me know when you're ready to present about uh, the next steps for a master plan. Perfect. We'll okay. start. We'll start looking into it immediately, and then we'll engage the city. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have something to say before we um, adjourn the meeting. What's going on, and what happened? What um, and I always say this about security. I really send in information. We had we had a two hour meeting about security three weeks ago and you were there. The private one that the uh, yes. session? Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, but I don't find that that was a, a security. Um, that's what it was. Meeting because we had two hours of nothing but security with the police. Leader. And that's what was we have there. We were not talking about what I've sent in, in the my, my, you know, my concern, my referred and everything. You sent in an email mm -hmm. after the two hour meeting about security with a bunch of questions that you could have asked well, we were in the meeting. But I don't find that, Mr. Chair, that we have a um, 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 want to have a, a um, sorry, a security uh, meeting like always we do, you know, regular meeting open to the public and you're trying to do something private that nobody knows, nobody can listen, nobody can ask questions. And I asked this for a long time ago. I don't think so that was fair. I don't see that meeting was talking about all my, my concerns. Secure, like I said, security is a sensitive thing and some things can be discussed openly, other things. And those things we cannot be talking in front because it's private and not just. And that's why we had, that's why we had the two hour executive session. If you have follow up questions for the superintendent or Lieutenant Craig. I, I really you know, don't know what is the issue, what's the hide, what is this? No hide, we already did this. It is, it is Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, but it is, it is. Well, this is actually not a security 
committee. It's a facilities committee. Yeah. Been how many time? How many months? I'm going from February talking about security. It's a two hour meeting about it. A meeting that you guys decide to do because was, I don't find that was a, a public um. And you were there. Meeting, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. It was there. Yeah, I was there, but I didn't. I just listened. Had all these questions you guys were saying. Could have asked at the time. But what the question I asked on the time? What is the problem? We can have the meeting, you know, um, public. You know, what is that? You know. I know things we don't supposed to talk because it's private and I know that's incorrect. No, I'm not going to do this. Motion to adjourn. Do not ignore me, Mr. Chair, because I never ignore you. I'm, I'm just, I'm not. Now remove my, my, when I'm talking because I'm supposed to ask a question about the uh, security. Do not do that. I never go over you. So motion to adjourn. Right. I make that motion. Is there a second? We need to have that. Um, a security. By Mr. Macaron, all in have favor. That. We need to have that. It's only there to tell you. Okay. Meeting's adjourned. Yeah. You never say nothing. You, you adjourn your meeting by Just yourself. Two hours, three weeks ago, Albert. That was not a meeting, Mr. Jeff. Was, everybody was there. It was not a meeting. Including you. My meeting. There wasn't a meeting. I don't know what's the problem. They need to hide it.